last stretch. It's a long stretch, but we're on the last stretch. I'm actually going to get to the chart today, Lord willing, and uh, explain some things. Now, there's several ways you learn. You contrast the difference between things, but also repetition. A lot of the things I'm going to say uh, over the whole course of this is there's a lot of repetition to it because that's how you learn it. And uh, especially when you get something that looks complex, you find out it's not as complex as you think it is once you understand all the things that are going on. Um, but we're going we're gonna to talk about the consummation, and then we're going to actually get into the chart. Uh, verse 27, And he shall confirm the covenant. This is Daniel 9. Verse 27, He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined, shall be poured upon the desolate. Now the word consummation means to bring to completion or to an end. And eventually God's going to wrap this thing up. Now, when I say God's going to wrap this thing up, it, you know, people sometimes think it's the end of the world. No, no, no. It's the beginning of a decent world. <laughs> uh, it's the end of this world system. When the Bible talks about the end, that means the end of this. The end of the nations and the politicians and a judicial system that's corrupt and everything else. To the, it's, it's over with. It's done for. Because why? Because Jesus Christ will be here on this earth, ruling and reigning for a thousand years. Okay? Um, think about what's going to be completed, because in verse 24, this is the things that are going to be completed. He says, Those seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins. And all this is in relation to Israel to make reconciliation for iniquity. You and I have reconciled with God through Jesus Christ, but Israel as a nation has not. Why? They rejected their Messiah. So that's got to be that's got to come to an end, or at least it's going to be finished, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Now, you know we haven't seen that. And if we have, man, I'm telling you what, it's not too good. It's like the, the post millennials that believe we're bringing in the golden age. It's like, whoa, where are they getting that from? If this is the golden age, I'd hate to see what the lead age looks like, you know. Or, uh, <clears throat> it's horrible. But it says to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy. To seal it up means that they're completing all the prophecies that you're given back there in the Old Testament. There are 500 prophecies about the second coming. All those are going to be fulfilled. Why? He's coming back. <laughs> and then it says to anoint the most holy. You and I have anointed him on our, uh, as the... King of our heart, if you want to put a uh, spiritualization on it. But Israel's never anointed him as the most holy. And they are. And that's what Daniel 9's about. Anything else, man, you're way off base. You're going to get fouled up. You're going to wind up some Calvinist or some sovereign grace nut. You know, you're just going to get fouled up. Because you're not believing what's right in front of you. And this has to do with Israel. A lot of people don't like the fact that Israel's still in the game. And they are. Why? Because God made promises. And God doesn't break them. And you better be glad of that. He made promises to Abraham. If he's going to keep Abraham's promise, that means he'll keep the promise to you, giving you eternal life. Um, but notice uh, uh, verse 26, at the very last it says, um, let's see, let me read the whole verse. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come to destroy the city and sanctuary, which we saw happened in history... And the end thereof shall be with a flood unto the end of the war. Desolations are determined. So not only the end as far as verse 24 and fulfilling those things that he promised Israel, but unto the end of the war. We're getting to the end of the war. Did, did you even know there was a war going on? Well, there has been. It has been a war that makes every other war in history look very small. You say, when did it start? Well, it started in Genesis 1-2, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. That's when the war started. And it's been going on ever since. And he's going to bring an end to it. Uh, <clears throat> so now we can look at the chart. And the key to the chart is a verse that almost everybody that I've studied that deals with this 
ignores. And I don't know why they ignored it, but Brother Estep didn't ignore it. Uh, look at Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. This is the whole premise for his chart. i got to find Daniel. Okay. I'm getting there. Daniel chapter 8. <clears throat> and look at verse um, 13 and 14. <clears throat> All right. Now, with Daniel 9 in mind, let's read, let's read these two verses. It says, Then I heard one saint, speak, one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision? Okay, how long? Concerning, and here's what is concerning, the daily sacrifice. Have we talked about the daily sacrifice? We said that that's probably the trigger that either brings the Antichrist down or triggers the raptures when they begin offering sacrifices on the altar. They didn't have to have the, the, the temple built, but that when Israel does that, man, that's, that's, a, that's kicking the thing off. Okay, and, and so far they've not been able to get that temple erected and offer any sacrifices, but they are talking about it now. They want to start offering sacrifices again, or at least the Orthodox population does, who happens to be in control of the government right now. It is ultra-Orthodox or ultra-conservatives. That's the, that's the party that's, in, that's with Netanyahu right now. They just got voted back in. He got voted back in. But notice this says, how long should be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice? Well, this is the first part of the week, right? Don't we have right here? See where it says? He's got, uh, I'll find it here in a second. The daily sacrifice. First part of the week here. How long should be the vision? The daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation. We know what that is. That is that putting that uh, that image in the holy place. Daniel or Matthew chapter not. I'm sorry. Sure. Matthew chapter 24, uh, where he talks about when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. Ye which should today flee into the mountains. You know how that thing goes. So he's talking about the daily sacrifice, and then. He's talking about sometime in the middle of the week because that's when the transgression of desolation occurs. And then he says to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. And we know how long that is. Because Revelation chapter 11 verse 1 and 2 tells you that they've trodden down the sanctuary in the area there or at least the, uh, uh, it talks about the Gentiles. Um, what's the wording? I got a good look at it. Daniel 11, not Daniel 11, Revelation 11. Boy, I'm having trouble with my mind today. Um, measure the temple, the altar, and the altar, and them that worship therein. Talked about the court, which is without the temple. Leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall be tread underfoot forty and two months. So you know what he's telling you? He says, okay, from the time the daily sacrifices begin to the desolation in the middle, or the abomination that make it desolate, Till, till the sanctuary is trodden underfoot, and it's 42 months. He's, he's saying, give me the number. How many days? Okay? Now, <clears throat> the reason I say this is, this is going to be for, it's going to give you a different number than 2,520 days, which is seven full years, is because, remember, when, when, when the temple was rent, when the, when the veil was rent in half in, uh, uh, at Jesus Christ's crucifixion, when that veil was rent in half, you know what that Jew, those Jews did, don't you? They sewed it up and kept it right on going. Okay? But we're talking about the daily sacrifices beginning again. They, just, they, didn't really end till, they probably didn't really end until 70 A.D. So you can't be talking about that time frame. He's talking about a future time frame. Um, it says, um, 
How long should be the vision? Concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. And he said unto me, Two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So he's talking about the full length. Well, the sanctuary sure ain't going to be cleansed till, uh, till the Lord comes back. Right? Because it's going, to be, it's going to be an abomination. So it's not getting cleansed till he comes back. And he tells you 2,300 days. And that's where you get 6.38 years. Uh, right here. 2,300 days or 6.38 years. It's not seven. <clears throat> Why? Well, look at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 and look at verse 22. Matthew 24, 22. And he says, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Well, what Brother Eastep found out was, and what we have seen and we've talked about many times, is that the last half of that week is not shortened for the time of great tribulation. It's not shortened at all. In fact, you are told so many times that it's three and a half years, 42 months, 1260 days, uh, three years and six months. I think I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times in your Bible you're told that that time frame is a complete 42 months. But yet he says he talks about the days being shortened. And people have brought up, well, He's talking about a 24-hour day being shortened. I don't know. I don't know, if I, I don't know if I could go with that. I mean, he says there's 12 hours in the day and 12 hours in the night. But if he cut the length of the time, not on the first front or the, the latter end of it, but what if he cut the time on the front end of it? It's still time, right? Okay? Kind of confuse people about where they're at. Especially if they think they've got the whole seven years, they might get, they might get fooled into something that's going to happen earlier. Hmm. Got to be careful of that, right? Rightly dividing the word of truth. Can you imagine somebody in the tribulation that's got this calculated and they're calculating according to a full seven years? They would be off on quite a few things, including the advent. But if they, <clears throat> if they believed what it says there in Daniel 8, 13, and 14... They know when this thing kicks off again, it's got 2,300 days to fulfillment. And you have seven years times 12 months times 30 days is 2,520 days. Now, he's got 2,550 and there's a reason for that. On a Jewish calendar, about every three and a half years, now this is going to get a little complicated, every three and a half years or so, they add a month you go from just Adar to first and second Adar. So this additional month of Adar is added, and what it does, it keeps the seasons in line. You know, whether, whereas we'll add to like seven different months, we'll add the, uh, January, or January, the 31st day of the month, okay? And we've got our, um, our leap year, there's an extra day. We've just done it in a different fashion, but the Jews on, the, on a lunar calendar, okay, what they do is they end up adding an additional month to bring the seasons in line, okay? Um, if one were added, and I believe there's a possibility that's ha that happened, he's got 250 days, 30 days added for full seven years. Well, 30 days may have been added here, but they're not added here. But they, I think they're added at the end. Either way, the adjustment's made, it's just it's not added in this number here. But it could have been added on the front as part of the, the, the shortened period. We'll get to all that. Is that making sense? I know some of you are like, you lost me, that's it, I'm done. Um, what it boils down to is this. It's 250 days short of seven years. 
250 days, where did they go? What happened to them? He said he cut them short. Well, there's no intermediate time being added because nothing's added that's needed to complete this and come to the consummation. What it boils down to is this. Do you know what happened after the 69th week? The 70th week began. You know what happened after the second week? The third week began. And the fourth. Let's go all the way through to 70. Now, what happened after the 49th week? When they said that they, that they needed to complete the city? The 50th week began. Why would the 70th week not continue if what was in the 69th week was fulfilled? The Messiah was cut off. And this is different than what anybody else teaches about this. That the 70th week actually started. And you know when it would have started? The night of his crucifixion. Well, let's put it this way. By the time you hit the evening and the morning, you know, once they went to 6 p.m. or sundown on, on the day of his crucifixion, you'd have been in the 70th week. That means his resurrection happened in the 70th week. Quite a few things happened in the 70th week. And the time just kept marching on. They started eating. There's no reason to suspect that it stopped. There's nothing to indicate that it stopped. As a matter of fact, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to go through, and it's, I'm going to show you from the Bible, in the book of Acts, it didn't stop. And they knew it didn't stop. Not there. And then we'll look for it did stop. Okay? <clears throat> uh, one of the things that the, someone made a comment one time that nowhere in the Bible is the church ever in relation to the 70th week. Now, that's good for, you know, when you want to teach eternal security, but it may not make good doctrine. Uh, in Matthew chapter 13, Matthew chapter 13, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 13, look at verse 44. And it says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto, unto treasure hid in a field. Now, we know what the treasure is. It's the children of Israel. We know what the field is. It's the world. It's the world. Which when a man hath found, he hideth. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus Christ hid himself. He discovered the treasure. He came here. And then he, he hides himself from the very people, from the very treasure he found. And for joy there, uh, thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field. He paid for him. He, no, he paid for the whole field. <laughs> I don't know what the Calvinist does with that because the field is the world. He paid for the whole field. But notice in verse 45. Now we know the treasure is the, kingdom of Israel, or is the children of Israel. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. And we know that a pearl is the only jewel that comes from a living organism. And the church is a living organism. It is an organism of believers worldwide. Okay? And what did he do? He bought it. That is a mystery of the kingdom. It happened in the 70th week, or at least at the 69th end of the 70th week, the death, burial, and resurrection. So I can find the church. Why? Because we're going to find out, by the way, look in Ephesians 2.16. And this took me a while to get this. So if you have difficulty with it, don't worry about it. In chapter Ephesians 2.16, he says that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross having slain the entity thereby. So the body begins at the cross. That's where it's prepared. That's where, and I'm talking about a spiritual body in which believers would be baptized into. Here's the thing, there's no population. It's not populated until Acts chapter 2. But it's ready at the cross. Okay? But we're going to find out in Acts chapter 2, guess what? And that's where the church begins. We're still in the 70th week. 
Here's something for you to keep in mind, though. Nobody knows that. And I mean nobody. The Apostle Paul is the one that gets the revelation of the church, Jew, Gentile, one body. Nobody knows. They have no clue. Why? Because God is offering them a legitimate opportunity to, to believe the truth, and they reject it again. He knows they're going to, but the offer is true and legitimate. Okay? Is everybody following? <laughs> um, Romans chapter 11. Now, we're not going to go through the whole chapter, but I was going to, I'm going to jump through some verses here. Because the first thing that comes to mind is, well, what happened? If the 70th week began, what happened? This thing should be been over with, you know, a couple thousand years ago. But it's not. Well, in Romans 11, 1, Paul starts addressing this very issue. And he says in verse 1, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. Because it certainly looks that way, doesn't it? I mean, listen, until 1948, the Jew wasn't even over there in his own land. He had no state. He had no capital. He didn't have Jerusalem. They were just, you know, just running around like sojourners, all just strangers wherever they landed. They were living all over the place. And now, well, now... See, you know, you've got a good argument for post-millennialism right up until 1948. And then your idea of something completely falls to pieces. Because the people that hadn't been a people, that hadn't had their own flag and their own autonomous government for 2,500 years, now they do! Isaiah 11, 11. God has regathered His people the second time. That ought to shock some folks. You'd think it'd shock them into the truth, but they're going farther the other way. And all the only thing they can do is come ignore what God did in bringing that nation back into its own land. Ignore it completely. And somehow just gloss over it like, oh, well, you know, oh, those aren't even really the Jews over there. Pe bizarre people. Rather than believe the book and believe what's in front of them. But look, 11.1. Have God cast away His people? No. He said, God forbid. Look at verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles as much as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. Something took place because we have an apostle to the Gentiles here. And he's the one addressing this. Um, verse uh, 20. And then he says, well, because of unbelief. They were broken off, and thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. The reason there's an apostle to the Gentiles? Because God has now given the Gentiles access to the root. I didn't say the church. He gave the Gentiles access to the root. And he says, stand in fear. Because if I broke them off, I can break you off from that, from that root, and I can graft them right back in. It's always easier to graft the original plant back into uh, the root than some wild olive branch, which is what we are. Or that's what the Gentiles are. He's talking about access to this thing. And he tells you they were broken off because of unbelief. That's exactly what we're going to find. Exactly what we're going to find. Verse 23. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be... Uh, and they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. Why? That's His promise. You cannot say God's done with that Jew. You have to make a liar out of God to do that. And then um, verse 25 to 28. For I would not, brethren, that she should be ignorant of this mystery. It is. I mean, when you're reading through there and all of a sudden, man, he's, you know, it's all about king, kingdom, king, kingdom, and all of a sudden now we're talking about a church? Did you ever notice that kind of... What happened? 39 books about a king and a kingdom, and next thing you know, we're building churches. It's funny how the churches want to be kingdoms. They're not. <laughs> They're not supposed to be. For I would not, brother, that she should be ignorant of this mystery, lest she should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. There's that access. 
For 2,000 years, guess what? The Gentiles of this world have had access to the Lord Jesus Christ through the preaching of the gospel. But look at it says, verse 26, And so all Israel shall be saved. Man, don't count them out. <laughs> don't count them out. They're not done yet. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant to them when I shall take away their sins. Remember, we talked about an end of the transgression to make an end of sins. That happens at the advent. But it's their promise that that's what's going to happen. That happens in the consummation, by the way. Um, so, what is revealed in the New Testament uh, sets the sequence of events for the future. Don't assume just because the church is present in the 70th week, okay, that somehow we're going to be present when it continues. Again, we knew nothing about it. It wasn't even a, it wasn't even a revelation uh, that anyone understood until Paul got saved. God gave him the revelation and says, guess what? I thought about this, man. I think I've got this somewhere in there. But when I think about the Apostle Paul, you wonder how he could go against God and go back to Jerusalem. And I finally figured out why he was so headstrong in that matter. He was there when God stopped the 70th week. He was standing there, man. He was the coat rack. He was, hold, he was holding the clothes of them that were killing Stephen. And God said, well, we're done there. Paul was there. He was, his name was Saul. He was there. And he realized right then, I was part and parcel to that. And these Jews are going to go through untold wrath for the next two millennia. Maybe he didn't know that, but he knew that he was part and parcel with that. He never got over it. Um, so, let me give you four reasons real quick why the church will, not, uh, will be raptured out before the 70th week continues. Daniel 70 weeks is about Jerusalem and thy people Israel, Daniel 9.24. It's not even about us. I don't know why you want to make it about us. It's not about us. We're not there in Daniel 9. We're not talked about in Daniel 9. It's not about us. It's about Jerusalem. It's about Israel. The church, the body of Christ, was to preach a different gospel. We, do not, we are not preaching the same thing that's going to be preached in the tribulation. There's an there's a everlasting gospel uh, that's preached over there. That's not the gospel we preach. Because there's no longer a question about who God is. You either, either worshiping the devil or you're worshiping the God, of the, the God the Creator. And that's why it says, fear God, keep His commandments. <laughs> that's what's going to be the preaching of the gospel in, in the tribulation. Um, it's a different, gospel means good news, and there are, there are like nine different gospels in the Bible. The Christian is told to look for the Lord, not the tribulation or the Antichrist. We're never told to look for these things. We're told about these things, but we're not told to look for them. Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what we're told to look for. Why? Because that's what's coming first. Okay? And I think I've got ten reasons in the message, but the, the, here's the other one. Like Enoch, okay, remember Enoch? The church is not appointed to wrath, but to obtain salvation. Enoch goes out before the flood. Noah's a picture of a Jew going through the trib. Uh, um, Enoch is a picture of a Christian taken out before the cataclysmic thing takes place. Why? We're not appointed to wrath, and there's nothing but wrath in the tribulation. The wrath of the Lamb, the, the wrath of Satan, the wrath of God, the wrath of Babylon. There's wrath all the way through there. And we're not appointed to that. We'll get to see our own trouble. Okay? But not that. So don't be fearful that, you know, somehow we're going to wind up in the, in the tribulation halfway through. Why? What? So you can mess it up? Be out there preaching the grace of God, you know, just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He says you've got to love, love not your life until the death. You're going to tell them, you're going to add that in? Do you tell people that now? I love not your life until the death. Is that how you preach? I don't preach like that. Why? Because they don't have to love not their life until the death. But in the tribulation, you do. 
Because what? You take the mark, you get beheaded. That's your two choices. And the only way you, you, you can be saved is not take that mark. Love not your life unto the death. Pretty clear. Thank God we don't have to do that now. I'd be preaching to an empty building. Or I'd have a, I'd have a guillotine up. No, I don't know. So, there's no reason to believe that the 70th week did not begin right after the 69th. Uh, the killing of the Messiah was prophesied and fulfilled. The Lord Jesus forgave Israel for killing him. Father, forgive them for they... Or no, see, uh, he says, uh, is that how you put it? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? Yeah. It, so he forgives them in Luke 23, 34. He forgives them for killing him. I wonder why. Because they're going to get another opportunity. Look at Acts chapter 1. And I hate to go through all this. We can probably just skip to verse 6. He mentions, though, Look at this, and being assembled together, verse 4, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. Well, probably well, the Holy Spirit, there's the promise that they're waiting on. Now, he's there 40 days, so there's 10 days that they're there by themselves till Pentecost, because Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. And he shows himself for 40 of those days, on and off, revealing himself. they got to wait 10 days. For John truly baptized with water, verse 5, well, that was to manifest the Messiah to who? To Israel. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Now notice this, verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the church to Israel? That's not what it says, does it? Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They're asking, now? Now? Daniel 9? Now? Restoring the kingdom? What? They haven't been a kingdom for 20... Since, since about 606 B.C., they haven't been a kingdom. Now, they've been, they've been a nation... They, let's put it this way. They've been back in the land, but they've never self-ruled. They were either under Persia, or they were under Greece, or they were under Rome. They were under somebody, but they were never self-governing. It was not their kingdom. It was somebody else's, wasn't it? Even when Jesus Christ shows up, man, the Romans have got it. Wilt thou this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? What a question. Well, why would that be? You notice he doesn't say, no. <laughs> He said, he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father put in His own power, but ye shall receive power. He goes, you don't know yet, but you're going to. But you're going to. Now, do you think he knows the answer? Maybe. I think he does. But it's got to be a legitimate offer, man. And we're going to find out that all the things that are needed to make that offer legitimate are right there. I'm going to take just a few more minutes. Let's look at Acts chapter 2. Man, when you get to Acts chapter 2, if you're telling me this is the church age and that the 69th week stopped everything and there's a whole week, then what in the world is going on in Acts chapter 2? It makes no sense whatsoever. As a matter of fact, the churches all over this country have been fouled up in Acts chapter 2 more than any other chapter in the Bible. Why? Number, look at uh, chapter 2, verse 14. First of all, it's a Jewish feast. You know, I, I, the, these charismatics talk about Pentecost like it's a Christian feast. It's not a Christian feast. Pentecost is a Jewish feast called the Feast of Weeks or called the uh, Pentecost in the New Testament. Um, look at verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and ye that dwell in Jerusalem. Huh. Jews. That's who he's talking to. 
And then look at verse 16. But this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. Now he's talking about a second advent prophet. Hmm. Verse 19. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Here's your signs and wonders that the Jew requires to believe a message. What's going on here? Don't sound like no church age to me. Verse 22. Ye men of Israel. Hmm. Not talking to the saints and the strangers or whatever. He just told them, he, he says, ye men of Israel. Look at verse 30. Therefore being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to his flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. This is about a throne. The throne of David that Jesus Christ would sit on. What's that doing in Acts chapter 2? I mean, if it's the church age... He's 2,000 years from sitting on that throne. But yet they're talking about it. Look at verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Talking again to the house of Israel. See, this thing wasn't over with. When he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, man, they got another opportunity, and which makes sense. God does everything these threes because He's a trinity. You had God the Father represented in the Old Testament, and He said the same, but they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me of being their king. First rejection. The Son shows up in the Gospels, and it's obvious that was rejected. They kill Him. They call for His crucifixion. God the Son. And now we're going to have another, another uh, opportunity, and it's going to be God the Holy Spirit. And a preacher's going to get up, and the Bible says about him several times, a man full of the Holy Ghost. Strike three is about to take place. But we're only at strike two, and that's why the book of Acts is still carrying on about a king and a kingdom. And he's talking about tribulation in second advent passages. Why? Because that's what's going to happen if they accept the message. <laughs> Do you realize that if they're in the 70th week, they're only within seven years of the Advent? And that's how it's being preached. And that's how it's being dealt out. Um, Acts 2, 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And you got idiots preaching this as the gospel for this age. He just look at verse 37. There's nothing, there's nothing about the death, burial, resurrection in the sense that they're believing that. They're getting baptized and repenting of that because they just killed their Messiah. It says, now when they heard this, what? Let all the house of Israel know assuredly, verse 36, that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were pricked of their heart and said unto Peter and to the arrest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What are we going to do? We've killed our own Messiah. He said, get in the water. What did John tell him to do? It, what did the, 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 uh, John the Baptist tell him to do? He said, get in the water. What was the baptism of water to do? Manifest the Messiah to Israel. It's just John's baptism post-cross. They're still trying to manifest the Messiah of Israel. That's what he tells them. Get in the water. Repent. Believe the truth. But there's nothing talking about a Savior here. It's about murdering their king. That's what they're changing their mind about. They're not talking about their own personal sins and that, that they're condemned to hell. It's all about, it doesn't really matter. We, we kill our king. That's what they're repenting about. Acts chapter 2 is clear. You're in the 70th week and they're still, they're given one more opportunity and it starts off, man, pretty good. I mean, the reaction's good. Men and brethren, what shall we do? That's the kind of reaction you want. I gotta stop. Just in the heat of it, too, boy. It's cool. But can you see that so far? Your Bible's not a mystery. It's just unfold. You just got to believe what you're reading right in front of you. 
The 70th week is business still rolling on, man. And then we're going to see perfectly where it stops. You're going, to, you're going to see it. The Bible's telling you, well, from that point on, it's telling you that it stopped. And then in, then in Daniel, or I'm sorry, Romans chapter 11, Paul confirms that it stopped. And that's one of the mysteries. Okay? All right. Any questions or comments about what we covered? Did I confuse anybody? Please don't all raise your hand at the same time. All right, if you're that far...